Previously, I've tackled two games that revolved around characters that were intended to have greatly flawed personalities, and interestingly enough, both failed to be compelling due to how one-dimensional they ended up being. Y2K's Alex and his journey from jerk to hero fails to win us over thanks to its convoluted plot, poor pacing, unsatisfying payoff, and lack of focus. Whereas Life is Strange's attempt at a lovable rebel unintentionally reminded people of their toxic relationships, thanks to her lack of personal growth and with the protagonist's lack of self-awareness. A defense often used for these kinds of characters is that people like this actually do exist, and the mere act of replicating these personalities is enough for us to be invested in their stories. And since it's intended to be like this, criticizing the material is an issue with the person, rather than the art. But I disagree with the statement. I genuinely don't think that achieving intent doesn't mean it's absent from criticism. And knowing people like this is not enough for me to be interested in a character. It may evoke familiarity at best, but if they don't explore anything beyond this foundation and are in service of a narrative that's subpar, then I'm tapping out. And having liked numerous stories about tragic, flawed, or awful people, the question becomes what separates the good from the bad? So let's take one of these stories here and find out why. Because in a game where the apocalypse brings out the worst in people, you get in turn an engaging story about an awfully flawed man trying to do the right thing. For those not in the know, Least of the Painful is a game heavily influenced by Earthbound. From the art, to the combat, to the music. The game blatantly wears its inspiration on its sleeve. But where the game differs, however, is its grossly adult subject matter. With a narrative sharing similarities with Children of Men, the Earthbound comparisons remain superficial, since the story tackles mature subject matters that would be quite unsuitable if they were ever to appear in the Mother franchise. So let's take a quick look at the story. It all started with a white flash. We don't know what caused it or why it happened, it just did. And because of this flash, every woman has either disappeared or died. And due to the lack of people who have the ability to give birth, society falls into anarchy, causing the lawless men of the world to begin to show their true colors. From the violent to the weird, to the perverse. And in this hopeless world, you play as Brad Armstrong, a drug addict full of regret as he was unable to save his younger sister from taking her own life due to their abusive father. Seemingly through happenstance, he stumbles upon a baby. And it's not some ordinary child, it's a girl. Seeing this child as a second chance at redemption, Brad immediately takes this child into his care. Now named Buddy, Brad and his childhood friends do everything in their power to raise and protect her from this awful world. As time passes and Buddy's existence becomes known to the world, Brad returns home to a bloody mess and a missing child. With Buddy now gone and the world desperate to repopulate humanity, Brad now must venture out into the world of Olaith to rescue his adopted daughter, no matter the cost. So it's a pretty hopeless world, right? It's depressing, bleak, and pretty sickening. And as such, the game is practically devoid of humor to strengthen this theme. Hold on, let me write this again. 
kind of a hopeless world ride, it's depressing, bleak, and sickening, and as such, the game uses its dark sense of humor to further strengthen these themes. Despite the futility of the world, Lisa decides to populate its cast with a colorful roster of characters. You got a guy who hates his dead wife who tells verbose stories, a legendary powerful man who just wants to provide you hints, and who could forget Uncle Sticky, who just wants to help Buddy grow up just a bit faster. There's a very tongue-in-cheek atmosphere in the game, from the battles, character designs, and the events that happen throughout your journey. And when compared to the likes of Y2K, where its wackiness, despite its justification, caused more confusion as opposed to intrigue, there's this reckless sense of abandonment in Lisa's apocalypse that allows us to accept anything, no matter how bizarre the situation becomes. <laughs> And while the humor is there, it's placed appropriately, and it's often used as a counterbalance to how screwed up the world is. It's a harsh reality, and the mechanics reflect that. Walking off cliffs causes a game over. Health items, currency, and resting areas are relatively scarce without a guide. And permadeath is present during certain fights. Things aren't so black and white in this game, and sacrifices have to be made. So this is all well and good, but how bad of a character is Brad? Well, let's dig a little deeper and find out who Brad actually is. But before I continue, if any of this sounds interesting to you and you haven't played the game yet, just tab out now, or watch another video of mine, because I'm about to go into spoiler territory, and this is a game worth going into as blind as possible. Look, I'll even give you a couple of seconds. Starting in 3, 2, 1. Brad, alongside his sister, Lisa, suffered from a great deal of abuse at a young age due to their father, Marty Armstrong. At some point after his wife's death, he becomes an uncaring alcoholic. He neglects his kids, and the only interactions he has with them are abusive, be it physical or sexual. And in the first game of the series, Lisa is the protagonist, and we get to experience the mental trauma she suffers. The severity of Marty's abuse has reached a point where she can't look at anything without being reminded of her abuser. When even self-mutilation isn't enough to stop the abuse, Lisa decides that the only way out of this nightmare is by ending her own life. Brad feels responsible for this tragedy due to his inability to stop his sister's death, and he copes with his demons through alcohol, painkillers, and most recently, a drug called Joy. This helps him stop the hallucinations of Marty and Lisa haunting him, though there are some unfortunate side effects. With Buddy now in the picture though, Brad uses her as a vessel to atone for his guilt by being protective of her, hoping that whatever happened to Lisa would never happen to Buddy. So Brad is just trying to be a better father than Marty. This is pretty likable. But when does his immorality start to kick in? You actually see a brief glimpse of it in the game's opening, where Brad's attempts in caring for Buddy results in him being overprotective, essentially suffocating her from experiencing anything beyond the walls of their home. Never leave this home. Never reveal your face. It's kill or be killed. Don't call me dad. It's understandable as to why he raises her like this, but this evidently causes a bit of trouble between the two's relationship. While not as extreme, this behavior unfortunately mirrors Marty's actions. And no thanks to his withdrawals, his hallucinations of the past impede him from truly living in the present. Both Buddy and Brad still get along, but the seeds of Brad's imperfections have been planted. And as the game progresses, he becomes a worse person. He's doing the best he can with what little information he has, but things start falling apart rather quickly. Withdrawals start to kick in harder than ever. He becomes more violent, more irrational. He kills his childhood best friends that helped raise Buddy. And your teammates may end up dying too, for the sake of a single girl. A girl, mind you, that doesn't want to be shackled to Brad anymore. Then the greatest side effect of Joy starts to kick in, turning into a Joy Mutant. A creature that you know full well is capable of great harm. It's a monster that acts solely on instinct and their deepest desires, be it violent, sexual, or something else. And when he's force-fed joy pills, 
Brad is now destined for self-destruction. And guess what is Brad's deepest desire? What have we been trying to do this entire game? So while Brad's road of bloodshed is justified in his eyes, for everyone else, he is a violent maniac on a rampage denying humanity's ability to bounce back from the apocalypse. You are playing a character that is selfishly trying to rid of his guilt by neglecting humanity's only chance of repopulating the world. This awful, untrustworthy world full of psychos and perverts where you can only assume the worst. And I think this is what makes Brad interesting when compared to the other immoral characters I've covered previously. He's trying to become a better person. This hint of humanity through his attempts to atone for his past is what keeps me engaged with Brad. And his arc towards the inevitable feels well earned since we see him develop over time. The game has set up a personality that I can empathize with despite hating what he ends up doing. Whereas someone like Chloe only has her attitude to be her defining characteristic once her father dies and she loses her best friend. There's nothing beyond this trait and she's narratively flat as a result. She's a judgmental ultra victim who doesn't want to take accountability up until the final scene when the story conveniently calls for it. And how she progresses in the story doesn't evoke any empathy out of me. And no matter the interpretation I look through this story, it still fails. Regardless of which one you choose, there's a disconnect with what this story wants to tell and what's actually happening. This makes me not care about Chloe's motivations, which makes Max's strong attachment for her feel quite undeserving. If I wanted a story about a troubled woman doing questionable things and knows full well how awful this person is being, I'd rather be watching Fleabag. Then in the case of Y2K, we spent way too much time with Alex being unlikable. So when the payoff is finally reached, it's unsatisfying and not worth the convoluted journey. The game spends way too much time trying to explain itself as it attempts to convince you that the story is so much more than it actually is. So what initial intrigue we get from Semi's disappearance is quickly drowned out by a story too interested in expressing a multitude of ideas that don't get enough time to develop. And as such, this lack of focus abruptly halts any sort of decent pacing for the plot or characters. So when these two are compared to a game with an awful character that does have focus and understands its tone and the story it's telling, these other characters pale in comparison to Brad as a result. Alex and Chloe's tragedies fail to characterize them in any interesting way. And while I can understand why they're written this way, and commit whatever actions they do throughout their respective story, all they ever did was create frustration or beg for our sympathy. And sympathy from tragedy doesn't immediately equal complexity. And only having this quality won't have me find a character's struggles compelling. You need something more. And Brad achieves this. He gains more than our pity. The game isn't trying to convince us into thinking that he's something he's not. He's just some dude who's about as screwed up as everyone else in Olathe. 
and the story understands this. He's ill-equipped, but he's trying. Brad managed to be a compelling character whose unfortunate circumstances made me feel something beyond pity, beyond a single emotion. And when you start playing as a buddy, who's now lashing out her hate for Brad through senseless killing, you get to play a character who's a result of Brad's awful parenting. And while she could have been written a lot better, when she finally confronts her inner demons and realizes that Brad genuinely cared for her, it's a scene that succeeds at being heartbreaking. Through all his faults, as awful as he was, Buddy recognizes that Brad was trying his best. So while Brad is written to be an awful person, Lisa manages to contextualize his behavior in a way that made me care about him. And no one-note attitude, no matter how special, can be as compelling as someone who's well-written. Unless you're my boy Terry Hints. Jesus Christ, I got way too invested in this game because of him. This game, because mm. some of them are just fucking- okay. OH NO! 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 That's my next video, by the way. Terry Hints, the best best friend. Ooh.